Good evening, everybody. A big mabu hai to all of you. And a big mabu hai to all those who are watching on satellite and web stream all over the world. Amen. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, once again we come before your holy presence in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ this evening. Thank you for gathering all your dear children from far and near for the last three days. Your children have come, Lord, from far and from the city of Manila to be gathered in your holy presence to celebrate this wonderful Feast of Tabernacles in your holy presence. Thank you for giving us this opportunity where we can be gathered unto you. Thank you for blessing us with this wonderful opportunity where we can come before your holy presence to minister unto you, to be gathered unto you as one body and one spirit. Unless you invite us, your word tells us no one can come before you. So we thank you for this honor. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you for this favor that you gave us that we may be gathered unto you. And now I ask you, Father, to stretch out your blessing hands and bless each and every one of your dear sons and daughters who are gathered here before your presence. Lord, whatever blessings they need, whether a healing or a miracle or a blessing, give their needs tonight. Tonight, let them receive their miracles, Lord. Tonight, open their eyes that they may see your glory. Tonight, let them experience a touch from you. Tonight, let them have an encounter with you, Lord. Tonight, let them also hear the roar from the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we pray now. I ask you, Spirit of the living God, you will open our hearts, you will open our ears, and give us an understanding heart and a listening ear that we may hear what the Spirit of God will speak to the nation. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I don't have one for be seated. Please be seated. Once again, I greet all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I sincerely like to thank our respected Bishop Dan and the IFP board for inviting us to be with you during this wonderful occasion. It's been a wonderful joy for Dr. Bruce Allen and his dear wife, Reshma Allen, and for Pastor Joe Sweet and I to be in your midst during these days. Thank you for showing us your great... Oops. Sorry. Thank you for showing us your great Filipino love. Salamat po. And I am sure it will not end today. Right? You, will you continue to love us? 
how much this much this much this much this much is that all only this much for how many days one day two days every day yes or no every day till the coming of the lord oh you all are wonderful says i wish i can take all of you back to chennai will you come yes but my suitcase is not big enough to put all of you there it's all right after you all get trained then you all come as missionaries to india amen and then you must turn india upside down amen do you believe that god can use you to do that not only india but you must go all over the world that is the will of the lord amen because god is going to raise up the filipino church to be apostolic and prophetic amen the whole nation will become apostolic and prophetic then you will go forth to pioneer and you will go forth to prophesy unto the nations of the world to different people group to kings to princess to everybody amen now this is a wonderful days of festive joy and during this period i've been sharing with you about the encounters i had with the chief prince angel of the philippines on the 17th of october while i was praying in my hotel room i had this visitation from this angel with outstretched wings and he stood before me and he identified himself as the chief prince angel of the philippines and then he said these words prepare the nation for revival prepare the nation for a visitation of god teach the young to war in the heavenlies although these words were specifically spoken to me but it also is applicable to every pastor every bishop every minister of god in this nation which means the word of the lord that comes to you as a leader is prepare the nation for revival prepare the nation for a visitation of god and teach your young the youths how to war in the heavenlies our war is not with flesh and blood but with principalities with powers in the air so you need to war in the heavenlies because that time has come now if you read revelation chapter 12 verse 7 8 9 and 10 it talks about a war in the heavens where michael and his angels will fight against the devil and his angels so there's a war that goes on and verse 10 tells us the remnant church on this earth has a part to play in the war so they both join hands together for the last days war in the heavenlies and for the angels of god to win over the war in the heavenlies the remnant church on the earth must participate together let me give you an example in exodus chapter 17 israel goes to war with ai in the valley of rephidim and god told the prophet moses to go up on a mount and he is to lift up his hands while joshua and his army are fighting the war so aaron and ur goes up together with moses up on a mount and moses lifts up his hands and the war goes on 
and Joshua and the Israelite army were winning the war. But you know, when you put up your hands, after some time you'll get tired. So you'll tend to lower down your hand. That is why most Christians today, foreseeing the tightness of their hands, they always lift up their hands halfway. Amen? So you know, why put up when you get tired? Instead of lowering it down, you are already well prepared. You are very, very wise. So you put it halfway. <laughs> you know, in the year 1997, I had been to Mongolia. And this one particular church, while the worship was going on, I saw one woman, young woman, she never lifted up her hands. While everybody else was lifting up their hands, this is the only woman, she just keep her hands straight like a wood by her side. And um, every now and then she will try to, you know, like throw up her hands and uh, then she would straight, straight. So I looked at this woman and I thought to myself, this woman is a strange woman. Everybody, not a single other person had put their hands down. They all, everyone, young and old, lifted up their hands in worship except this woman. So I thought, okay, this woman is just like many Indians, no, lazy, who don't want to put up their hands. So I just thought like that. Uh, every now and then I would glance at the woman, but she never lifted up her hands. But occasionally she would just like, try to put up a hand and I used to wonder why she's trying to do that when she can just jolly well put up her hands like this right jolly well and jolly be <laughs> jolly be is better than KFC you know <laughs> amen <laughs> So much tastier. <laughs> hey, you must come and open a branch in India. <laughs> so I can always eat Jollibee. <laughs> anyway, and after the meeting was over, then I asked the pastor a question. I said, who is this woman who never lifted up her hands? And he told me, a very pathetic story about this woman. This woman got married very young and frequently they had quarrels between the husband and wife. And one day, due to a severe quarrel with the husband, she decided to end her life. So when her husband had gone away, she jumped down from a high-rise apartment and fall down to her death. So when she fell down, she stretched out her hands to stop her fall. And in the fall, her hands broke to pieces. And she survived, miraculously she survived, but her two hands were broken to pieces. And the doctors could not put back her bones again. And instead of two hands, now she has two wooden hands. And the pastor told me, every time in worship, this woman will be crying when others are lifting up their hands. And she will struggle to push up her hands so that by the force of a push, she hoped that her hands will go up so that she can worship God. You know, when I heard that, I felt so condemned for judging that woman. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. I'm going to make another point after that. I felt so condemned for judging that woman. See how quick we are to judge people without knowing the truth. And I repented before God. And then when I had a chance to see the woman, I asked forgiveness for her. I said, I'm so sorry for judging you. But you look at this, 
a, a person who has no hands is struggling to lift up the hands but the people who have hands don't want to lift up their hands so perhaps you she should you should exchange your hands with her amen any volunteers so so moses was lifting up his hands and every now and then when his hands get tired he will let down the hands when he lets the hand down israel will be losing the war and aaron and ur saw that and they realized there was a connection between moses lifting up his hands and letting it down so they quickly roll a huge boulder under moses made him sit down and they stood by either side to hold up his hands so that israel can win the war now what has or what is the relationship between moses holding up his hands and israel fighting the war what is the connection there shouldn't be any connection the angels of god are fighting together with israel but what is the connection to do so i took it up before the lord in prayer because the lord was teaching me about spiritual warfare and to train the youth army for the end time warfare so i asked him this question lord what is the connection between moses lifting up his hands and israel winning or losing the war and this is what the lord explained to me he said have you seen a lightning conductor on the roof of the houses have you do you have a lightning conductor on the roof of your house now for the lightning to be specifically guided to the ground without randomly striking anywhere the lightning conductor on the roof of a house safely guides it to the intended way to the intended path to the intended direction in the same manner when god calls someone to participate together in a spiritual warfare they say the captain on the earth when he lifts up his hand he is like the lightning conductor and the angels coming down from heaven will look at the man that god has appointed with his hands stretch out and they know this is their man this is the captain of the lord and they come through him to fight together with the earthly army so this is our part in the last days war so the young people were going to be engaged to be involved in the last days war should be trained should be taught how to war in the heavenlies now this morning or this afternoon i shared with you the first part of this message where we talk about how the nation can be prepared for a revival tonight we are going to look at the second part of this message to prepare the nation for a visitation to have an encounter with god god wants to visit this nation so when god comes to visit a nation how should we prepare ourselves this is what we need to know this is what god intends for the church in the philippines for the nation in the philippines for all believers as a whole to learn how you should prepare yourselves your house your household your church your family your city your village your region and your nation for a visitation of god so obviously we need to ask a question how to prepare a nation for a visitation there are two important ways number 1 when government leaders visit a city or a place and the local leaders will run here and there to clean the streets 
to paint the places and decorate the walls. Does it happen in the Philippines? Oh, same like India. You know, before a minister or a senator or a government leader comes, the local councilmen or the local government leader don't bother. The street lights will not be working. The common areas where the water taps are, they are you can't even find a single drop of water coming and all the roads will be broken. This will be the daily common life of everybody. But as soon as an announcement is made that the provincial governor is coming, suddenly you'll find all the contract workers cleaning up the street, all the street burbs will be put up, and the whole street, the whole area, all painted very nicely, and it looks like it's Christmas time. And instead of Christmas, you will see a, a minister or a government leader visiting the street. Now this is point number one. The streets and the places are cleaned, painted, decorated. Point number one. Point number two. And then before they come, the things that are not orderly, the things that are damaged are repaired. That's point number two. In order to prepare the nation, in order to prepare the church for a visitation, you need to do these two things. Now let's look at these two things in greater detail. Streets clean, painted, decorated. What do they mean? Let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 9 to 11 for an example. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day for on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So the Lord told Moses, I am going to come down. I am going to visit the people. The people are going to see my glory. Before that can happen, the Lord told Moses three things to do. He must prepare the people with three things. Number one, he says, sanctify them. Number two, ask them to wash their clothes. And number three, husbands and wives should abstain from sexual relationship for three days. They should be separated, they should be clean. These are the three things God told Moses to prepare the people to receive a habitation or a visitation from God. Now, what applied to the people of Israel in the natural? Now we are going to look at it from the spiritual point of view. How does it apply to us under the new covenant? Number one, to sanctify means to fast and pray. Which means you are going to establish a regular disciplined life of fasting and prayer. You know, in the first century, when the New Testament church was born, there was a daily or a weekly disciplinary practice in the church to fast every Wednesday and every Fridays. Twice a week, the early church fasted. That was their custom. That was a practice. Now, this does not mean we are becoming very legalistic. This does not mean we are very religious minded. No. This is self-discipline. This is self-control. This is crucifying the flesh. This is bringing your body under subjection. If you read Matthew chapter 17, 
after the transfiguration experience when the lord jesus came down from the mount there was a commotion at the bottom of the mountain a father brought his demon possessed son to the remaining disciples who didn't go up on the mount and asked them to cast out this demon and the disciples could not cast out the demon so the father cooked up a big commotion and he complained to the lord jesus that his disciples could not cast out the demons and the lord jesus looked at the little boy or young boy who was demon possessed he cast out the demon and the boy was healed and after that the disciples asked the lord jesus a question why could we not do it and the lord jesus answered them this kind does not go out but by prayer and fasting so the disciples could not cast out because of their lack of faith and in order to overcome this lack of faith the lord jesus told them you need to build a life of prayer and fasting the very fact that the lord jesus could do that it also means he himself was fasting and praying that is why he could cast out the demons so the number one discipline that we need today which is a great lack in our christian life and in our church practice is a lifestyle of fasting and praying you know most of the time we only fast and pray when we are in a crisis when we are in a danger then we proclaim a fast then we fall on our face and you don't even have to fast because when you're so weighed down by your problems you lose all appetite to eat so you are under a false fasting amen you are false because you lose your appetite to eat but instead of that if you build a regular practice of fasting and prayer maybe following the example of the first century church every wednesday every friday in our ministry in our organization we fast every saturday all our staffs our entire office is shut down and we all gather to fast and pray for our ministry and for all our needs and then once a month we gather all our partners because they're scattered all over south india and we fast the third saturday of every month from 10 in the morning right up to 4 in the afternoon and one day about 3 years ago the lord told me teach the children also how to fast and pray so we gathered all the children from 6 years old up to 12 years old to another room and we have special children services for them so for a long time those children were not fasting because it is a popular concept that children cannot fast they are too young to fast they always have hunger pangs they must eat every 3 hours or 4 hours this is a popular notion so i went along the game and we provided snacks for the children at a, a break like during lunch break so a few months ago about 6 to 8 months ago when i was studying about all this then a thought came into my heart if we are going to prepare the children for the last days we should also teach them the discipline of fasting so i called my children's ministry team and i told them this coming month all the children are going to fast no snacks no drinks for any one of them they can only drink after we finish the fast at 4 in the afternoon so my staffs they protested they say no uncle how can these children they will die say <laughs> <laughs> so i told them don't worry if they die bring them to me i will resurrect them <laughs> amen what are we here for right to resurrect the dead amen oh then they said oh they may not die but they may faint so don't worry if they faint bring them to me 
I have bottles of water, I will sprinkle the water on their faces and they all, all get up. And they were still not sure, I said, don't worry, we also have doctors and nurses uh, who come to our meeting and they will tend to the children when they have any problem. So, with some reservations, yet they had to obey what I say, the very first month when we taught the children to fast, from 10 in the morning right up to 4 in the afternoon, 300 children were gathered in our little gathering and not a single one of them complained for food or asked for water. Not a single one of them. And this has been continuing for at least one year now. The children have been trained. Amen. All these little ones, from six years old to 12 years old. So, the Filipino children should also be taught like that, how to fast and pray. Then they all will become sharp, mighty arrows in the quiver of the Lord. Amen. So, a discipline of fasting and prayer should be incorporated into our Christian life. Secondly, wash your clothes. Why wash your clothes? Every day we are washing our clothes. Don't you? Oh, only a few. The rest of you don't wash your clothes. My, 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 my. You are just like the Tibetan people. The Tibetan people wash their clothes only once a year. Amen? So you are like the Tibetans? Only once a year? You don't wash every day? Or at least two days once? You don't? If you are really washing, you should be answering me. But you are not answering, you are keeping quiet. It means you are not washing your clothes. You know the Tibetan people, because of the harsh winter climate, they are not sweating. And because of scarcity of water, because water is very difficult to get, they don't wash their clothes. They don't even wash their pots and pans. You know, in the year 1995, I had been to a place in Nepal called Mustang. To go to that region in Mustang, we need to walk up the mountain, down the valley for five days. And there's no other mode of transportation. So we were walking for five days. On the third day, we had to camp at a small village for the night. So in every village, you know, the villages in that region are usually composed of three houses or two houses. That's called a village. <laughs> they, you know, those people, it's all scarce area. So if there's even a one house, it's called a village. Anyway, so we entered into this house. It is also like a lodge where passing visitors can pay for a bed and for food and sleep there for the night. So we paid for the bed and we paid for the food. And there were, besides my two associates and I, there were another two Tibetan visitors who were also passing by. So the house owner was cooking food. So since the other two guests came first, they were served food first. And I observe how this lady was cooking the food. I like to observe how people cook, but I don't know how to cook, you know. So I was, uh, saw her, how she cooked, and then she served the other Tibetans with food. And after uh, serving them, they, you know, there were, in the whole house, there were only five plates. So two plates were used by this guest. So there were three more plates. So I thought, okay, the three more plates were for me and my two associates. And, uh, and she cooked more, and then she put food on the plate, and this uh, person, instead of serving to us, they were eating it, eating the food by themselves. So I thought to myself, there's no water nearby. How is this woman going to wash her plate? So I was very curious. Because 
there are three plates and three person are eating so after she finished eating she took the plate and she licked <laughs> She licked left, right, top, bottom <laughs> until the whole plate was sparkling clean. <laughs> and then she put on new food and handed the plate to me. <laughs> now I didn't know what to do. Whether to reject it or to partake it. I can't reject because I'm, I was hungry as a bear. And then how to eat it when it contains all kinds of saliva, germs. <laughs> I'm not kidding, you know, Scout's honor. So I took up the plate before the hands, before the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you for the food. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. The name that is above all name. Let every germs die. <laughs> Let this food be health to me. And if you want to know whether the prayer was answered or not, the very fact that I'm staying alive before you is a sign the prayer was answered. So, have you heard of Sadhu Sundar Singh? I'm sure you have, okay. So once he went to the eastern part of Tibet to evangelize. And uh, the following day, he took a bath by the river and he washed his rope. And then he sat by the river bank to wait for the clothes to dry so they can put on and go back into the village to preach the gospel. And while he was washing, he suddenly noticed that the entire village had gathered around to see him washing his clothes. And they were all looking with great shock. And uh, then Sadhu Sundar Singh turned around and he looked at this whole village staring at him. And he asked them, why are you all staring about? They said, sir, you are washing your clothes. So he said, yes, what's wrong with that? And they said, sir, only sinners wash their clothes. <laughs> Holy men don't wash their clothes. So all you people who are washing clothes every day, now you know who you are. So, if you want to be a saint, I am sure, as far as clothes are concerned, you don't want to be a saint. So, in the same manner, the Israelites are now walking in the wilderness. If you have ever been into the Sinai Peninsula, you will know that there are no waters anywhere. That is the reason why they were always complaining and grumbling to Moses to provide them water. So when there's no water, how to wash the clothes? You cannot wash the clothes. Furthermore, the Bible also tells us that God supernaturally made all their clothes to be clean, neat, and smelly good. That's what happened to them. However, on this particular day, the Lord told them, wash all your clothes, dry them, Put on nice clothes and come and stand before me. Now what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Analyze your soul. 
for spots of the flesh. You now the Bible tells us we have been given the garment of salvation and the rope of righteousness when we got saved. Two garments have been given to us from the day you got saved. And it is our duty to make sure those garments are not moth-eaten and neither are they soiled or become dirty. So every day you need to analyze yourselves. Each night before you go to bed, don't just suddenly drop to your bed to sleep. Pause for a moment, maybe a 15 minutes. Analyze your heart. Is there any spot on my soul? Is there any uncleanliness on my mind? Is there any uncleanliness in my soul? If they are, you should be cleansed before you go to bed. You should not sleep with your sins and continue your sins the following day. Jude verse 23 and James chapter 5 verse 2. Number 3. Come not near to your wives. Abstain from sexual relationship. Now what does that mean for us now? A woman in the Bible allegory always signifies flesh, the works of the flesh. So here it means put away the works of the flesh from your life. Galatians chapter 5 verses 17 to 21 talks about the 17 kinds of the works of flesh that in every day in our life we are doing. If you study those few scriptures, out of the 17, you will find that all of us have at least a few. A few of them. Even one is enough to soil your garment. Now if you look at the scripture or the screen, say the works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Now if you don't do all this, your good saints, now look at the next one. Hatred. Ah, there it goes. Contentions. That's another problem one. Jealousy. Outbursts of wrath, anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, causing of divisions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, partying. Now these are the 17 kinds. And I'm sure while I was reading through all that list, your heart has already been convicted of a few of them. Am I right everybody? Now you see, these have already soiled you. This has already defiled you of sexual contamination, of impurity. Your soul has become impure. So we want to put away all this from your life. Put away all this. Sanctify a fast. Live a fasted life. Have a regular practice of fasting and prayer. Analyze the garments of your salvation. Analyze your soul. Analyze your mind for any sins. Put them away. And then analyze your life. Put to death every works of the flesh in your life. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 says, The spirit and the soul must be perfected, clean and holy. Now, to summarize all that, what the church must also do is, now this, what we saw so far are personal. Now, the next point I'm going to share with you is corporate. You must weep and cry for the sins and abominations in this land. 
Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 Every day their sins and abominations being carried out in this land all over the 7,000 odd islands now the people who are involved in that do not know how to repent they don't know because their eyes are blinded but you who are the children of light you who are the people of God you should bend your knees fall on your faces fast and pray weep and cry for the sins and abominations of the land this one thing the chief prince angel told me very strongly to tell you a, a people must rise up in the land who will cry day and night weep for the sins and abominations of the land one day crying is not enough three days of gathering together in a convention like this and then we pray we cry is not enough because for the three days the land can be sanctified what about the rest of the 362 days that is why God gave a counsel to raise up watchtowers 24 hours houses of prayer which Bishop Dan and the IFP ministry have done to raise up the houses of prayer but every church every home should become a morning house a house of mourning where you mourn and you weep for the sins and abominations of the land every day in any part of this nation there's adultery being practiced there's fornication taking place there's all kinds of sexual fornication vices taking place even among Christians witchcraft taking place magic voodooism taking place all this is taking place all over the land drunkenness revelries and then infighting in the churches pastors fighting against one another church members fighting against one another all this is taking place all over the land the people who do know their God the remnant ones you should fall on your faces fast weep and pray mourn for those who are committing all this the righteous they should do that next look at the Levites in Leviticus chapter 9 verses 1 to 4 now this Levites means ministers of God how they should prepare themselves it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel and he said to Aaron take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord and to the children of Israel you shall speak saying take a kid of the goats as a sin offering and a calf and a lamb both of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering also a bull and a ram as peace offerings to sacrifice before the law and a grain offering mixed with oil for today the Lord will appear to you now before God can appear before them Moses was counseled by the Lord that the Levites the ministers of God the leadership in the church they should sanctify themselves now you will find four offerings that are mentioned here sin offering burn offering peace offering and a meal offering what do they signify the sin offering means cleanse yourselves daily first John chapter 1 verse 9 even a minister of God those who are in the leadership we are not immune to sins knowingly or unknowingly 
we all commit that so every day to examine our lives and then confess those sins and cleanse ourselves by the blood of the lamb secondly burn offering what is the burn offering signify to crucify the works of the flesh romans chapter 6 verse 11 to 13 galatians chapter 5 verse 24 mortify put to death every works of the flesh even the members of your body bring them under subjection put them to death because you are no more children of darkness you have been translated now your members should no more be dedicated towards unrighteousness but now should be committed to righteousness thirdly peace offering what does that mean maintain a clean conscience before God all the time let your conscience be without offense before God second Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 chapter 10 verse 22 and first Peter chapter 3 verse 16 check your conscience to see whether is it clean clean pure without offense before God finally a meal offering what does the meal offering means maintaining an uninterrupted fellowship with the Lord first John chapter 1 verse 7 and it says when you maintain a uninterrupted fellowship with God that fellowship of light will cleanse you will sanctify you and make you clean and holy so what should the ministers of God do Joel chapter 2 verse 17 says the ministers of God too should weep before the Lord for the sins of the land for the abominations of the land you cannot relegate this to the prayer groups to do or just let the intercessors do and the pastor always goes on a vacation no the minister of God has a serious responsibility to weep before the porch to weep to stand before God to weep and cry for the sins and abominations of the congregation several years ago or maybe not not too many several years ago just a couple of years ago after one of my uh, visit back to India after a, a convention in the Philippines a young Filipino girl wrote to me for prayer and initially this girl was doing good in her spiritual life then after some time she got involved with a, a relation in a relationship and because of the relationship she ended up committing sexual uncleanly acts now this is a born again water baptized spirit of fear tongue talking Christian girl what this girl did her church pastor does not know and this girl was struggling with the sexual sins of her life she used to write to me regularly she said she will plead with me uncle please pray that I can overcome this evil in my life she, does, she didn't want to but the weaknesses of her flesh was stronger than the spirit because the spirit was not fat and you're feeding the flesh more than you're feeding the spirit so because the flesh is fat more the flesh overcomes the spirit and in a moment of weakness you will say yes and succumb to sin rather than like Joseph flee away from the scene of crime so 
Then this girl fell into sin. Then she wrote me another mail with lots of tears. And her first question was, this is a young girl, a youth like many of you. Will the Lord forgive me? She felt so condemned. Will the Lord forgive me? Will the Lord restore me back to his calling? Will the gifts of the Holy Spirit work in my life one more time? That was her cry, her sincere cry. I wrote back encouraging her. I said, my dear daughter, if you sincerely repent, God will surely forgive you and restore you back into the paths of righteousness. And after that, I never heard from her for the next several years. Till today, never heard from her again. So uh, the pastor doesn't know these things that are going on in his church. So the pastor should, a minister should weep for the sins and abomination in the congregation so that God can visit the church. Secondly, the first is to cleanse. The second is the damaged roads are repaired, things that are disorderly are put in order. So the second thing that we need to do for a visitation to come is to put things in order. Or to use a biblical phrase is put your house in order. Let's look at two examples in the Bible. Mark chapter 14 verses 12 to 15. Passover has come. The disciples together Lord Jesus are going to eat the Passover. So they ask the Lord Jesus where he wants to eat the Passover and this is what he tells them. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then, now please note verse 15. Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. Now the Amplified Bible gives a little bit more depth of this scripture. And let me read to you this scripture from the Amplified Bible. And he will himself show you a large upper room furnished with carpets and with dining couches properly spread and ready there prepare for us. So what does this signify? Orderliness. Orderliness in the house of God. Orderliness in your life. Is your house in order? Is your Christian life, is your life in order? Or is it disorderly? Is it organized? Is it neat? Is it orderly? Orderliness is also part of holiness. Is your church in order? Is it clean, neat and tidy for the living God to come in? About two years ago, I was invited to speak at a church in Singapore. So this is a new church that I've never been before. And when I went up to the, after I was introduced, I closed my eyes to pray before I shared the message. And I saw an angel of God looking at the church and there were many many boxes boxes of different kinds and they were all scattered about all over the church and the angel look at all the boxes they are not where they are supposed to be so the the first thing the angel told me is there is lots of disorder in this church 
meaning people who are called to do works are not functioning in the call and the church is not in a good order then the angel remove all the boxes to one corner and he stack them up by category big boxes in one area small box medium sized boxes in another area and small boxes in another area he neatly organized them and put them in order then the angel looked at me and pointed a finger at the pastor's wife and told me does she know what is her calling she is doing things that she is not supposed to do see that is also disorder when a person who is called to be a pastor instead of being a pastor if he becomes an evangelist that is disorder a person who is called as an evangelist instead of becoming an evangelist you become a pastor that is disorder so is the orderliness in your life are you where you are supposed to be or are you flirting from church to church this is another very popular thing today you don't like this church you migrate to another church you don't like that church you migrate to another church so forever you have your suitcases all packed and ready and a passport in your hand to go traveling from one church to another church today i tell you in the name of the lord what you are doing is you are flirting you are flirting and you are committing adultery spiritual kind where you are planted you know i i speak with you with all humility and love there is no perfect church neither is there a perfect member so if there's no perfect church and there's no perfect member how can you look for a perfect church because the perfect church is looking for a perfect member and the perfect member is looking for the perfect church both of them don't exist only the lord jesus christ is perfect amen only he is perfect and he fashions us molds us into lively stones in whichever church we are planted he plants you in a particular church just because you don't like this you don't like that you transfer yourself you know one day a couple came to me for prayer and they said you know uncle please pray for us uh, we are praying for god to show us which church to go so i asked them what's the problem what's wrong with your present church then they told me all the problem so therefore we don't feel comfortable to be there so uncle can you please pray with us and prophesy to us which church to go so i looked at the couple and asked them how long have you been married 10 years in the 10 years has it been one blissful happy no nonsense marriage they said no sometimes it's up and down so when there were ups and downs have you ever thought of leaving your wife I said no then i asked the wife have you ever thought of leaving your husband no how can we do that because that's my wife and then i asked them how many children do you have three have you ever disciplined your children or have your children been such a lovely cherubic angelic children no uncle some of them are devils <laughs> if there is one angel there are two devils in the house so i said okay since there are two devils in the house have you ever thought of chopping those two devils and throwing them out of the house uncle how can you say that they are our children so i said if you won't do all that why are you jumping church that which is your flesh you put up with your flesh 
you tolerate your flesh in spite of their weaknesses and shortcomings you should not jump church you should only leave church when your pastor gets out of the will of god or we is no more walking right before god or he is talking preaching wrong doctrines then leave other than that just because he didn't greet you didn't call you didn't shake your hands these are silly reasons to leave the church which many people leave the church for such silly reasons i mean am i right my pastor never visit me i leave the church my pastor never called me i didn't come to church he never called to enquire about me you know to you he's one pastor but to your pastor you are one of a hundred believers how is he going to attend to everybody anyway orderliness in the church now look at the sacrifice that elijah prepared in first kings chapter 18 verse 33 the bible very beautifully says that and he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid it on the wood and said fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood now look at the script first part he put the wood in order when he cut the wood he laid them in proper order on the altar and then he cut the bull to equal pieces and laid them in an orderly fashion on the wood before the fire of god came down to consume the sacrifice put your house in order is your house in order or is it disorderly second example matthew chapter 21 verses 12 to 14 the lord jesus christ when he entered into the temple in jerusalem he cleansed the temple then jesus went into the temple of god and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he said to them it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves after the lord jesus cleansed the temple now look what happens next then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them for the god of glory to come and visit your church visit your nations first cleanse your temple cleanse the temple cleanse your church of everything that defiles everything that defiles the people who defile may be the largest titus in your church may be the largest offering givers and if you do not discipline them or put them away for fear that you will lose your finances it wouldn't take long for god to curse your church that it will dry up you know your faith should not be on this rich man who tithes your faith should be on jehovah jireh amen it is jehovah jireh who called you not this church members one member may come today another member can go today they can come they can go but jehovah jireh is with you all the time all the time so cleanse the temple put away the things that are disorderly the next thing the third thing that is required for to prepare ourselves for a visitation of god is unity in worship that's the third thing now look at second chronicles chapter 5 verses 12 to 14 the bible tells us all the musicians and all the singers 
and all the trumpeters were one they were united means every singer was singing in the same key all hearts were united together all the musicians their hearts were united together with the chief musician or the choir master their hearts and their minds were all united together they were not thinking ayo it's getting late when will the choir master finish the song i need to go or you may be thinking ayo it's getting late so ready 4 minutes to 9 when is the speaker going to stop are you thinking like that i'm just halfway through so we'll go on for another 1 hour is it okay everybody yes. after all today is the last day right the musicians and the singers and the trumpeters should be one every person in the congregation must unite their heart together with oneness with the musicians when that happens the bible says in second chronicles chapter 5 verse 14 so that the priests or look at verse 13 indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the lord and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praise the lord saying for he is good for his mercy endures forever that the house the house of the lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the lord filled the house of god now when we all every single person in this astrodome when you unite your hearts with oneness together with the musicians together with the singers when we all sing with one heart with one voice then the thick cloud of god's glory will visibly come down in our midst if this can happen in the old testament this should happen more in the new testament because of the blood of jesus christ because now a door has been open for us to enter into the holies if we can all enter into the holies and see god then we should bring back the glory of god but we hardly see this in the new testament church because all our hearts are divided the singers are divided the musicians are divided we are not making one voice in the last days god is going to pour a new spirit of praise and worship into the church a new anointing is going to come where instead of singing self centered churches i mean self centered songs that do not magnify or glorify or praise god they don't if you look at most of the songs that we sing in our churches they are more self centered bless me songs there's no praise there's no glory there's not magnifying the name of the almighty god but god is not going to pour a new anointing where the musicians ears will be open to hear sound from heaven where the singers ears will be open to hear songs sung by angels in heaven and they will hear the songs the choir master spiritual eyes will be open translated to heaven to see the heavenly choir singing and worshiping god and you will hear the songs and you will write those songs and bring them back to earth and teach the congregation to sing the songs that are sung in heaven amen when you do that then the glory that is in heaven will come down in our midst amen so for god to pour this new wine then the old wine skin must first 
be broken, be torn, and become a new wine skin. Secondly, another anointing God is going to pour. This anointing is going to be poured upon the children. Now, look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 15 and 16, together with Mark chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. But for our reading, let's look at Matthew 21, verses 15 and 16. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple. Now the mothers, when they came together with the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, they were carrying their babies and they were dragging their toddlers into the temple. And all the babies and all the toddlers were crying loud, just like most children and toddlers do. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees as well as all the other people heard the cries of the babies. But do you know how God saw that? Now look at the verse 15. The babies, the children were crying in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. How can, you know, logically, the children are crying, but how can they be saying, Hosanna to the son of David? In fact, if you read Mark chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, they were singing, Hosanna to the son of David, and blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed be the kingdom of God that comes now. They were singing songs of the coming kingdom of God. These are little children. And the Pharisees were so indignant, and they scolded the children, and they rebuked the Lord, and they said, Lord, don't you hear all these things? And the Lord Jesus said, yes, I've seen all this, but have you not ever heard? And he quoted Psalms 8-2. Out of the mouth of babes and nursings, infants, you have perfected praise. Or another translation says, you have ordained strength, which means... In the last days, God is going to pour a new anointing upon the babies from zero age up to three years old. A new anointing will be poured upon them and where they will begin to praise God. They're going to worship God. A new anointing will be poured upon them. And when they do, that praise, that worship, will give them strength to cast out demons. Can you believe that? A newborn baby will cast out demons. Three years ago, while we were having our monthly fasting prayer, an angel of the Lord appeared before me and he read from a scroll. He said, God is calling you to do a new training program for little children because their time has now come for Psalms 8-2 to be fulfilled. So after this angel revealed this to me, I shared a message based on all that. And there was a mother from a different city in outside Chennai called Bangalore. And she had a one-year-old or newborn baby. She has a uh, eight-year-old daughter and a one-year-old baby and she heard the message she went back home and something happened a year later a servant girl one of her distant relatives came to work for her and little did they know that the servant girl was a demon possessed girl in the nights when everybody are sleeping every pots and pans in the kitchen will fly like playing basketball they'll all fly everywhere and in the morning when the woman of the house come she'll find all the pots and pans in all over the kitchen and the milk will be spilled over everything will, will go topsy-turvy so they didn't know what was the problem this went on for several days then one day 
the the woman found out that her niece who the 13 year old niece who comes to work for them is demon possessed and in the night she used to walk around the house with a knife long 12 inch knife at into every bedroom can you imagine you have a niece like that when you all are fast asleep and she walks around your bedroom with a knife in the hand and I don't think you can sleep peacefully so this woman didn't know what to do she can't chase away the girl because she's a relative so one day one morning after her son who's now one and a half years old was awake she carried the boy down from the second floor to the kitchen to make him some milk at that moment this niece came out of the kitchen with the feeding bottle in her hand and this little boy looked at this his cousin he just stretched his hands and in his baby language just laughed at her at that instant the woman the aunt her spiritual eyes were open and she saw a black dark demon spirit come out of the girl and depart out of the house this one and a half year old toddler cast out a demon spirit when the woman saw that she was shocked because she knew that as soon as her son put up the hand and laughed the demon left and as she was pondering what is happening she remembered the message that I preach that in the last days Psalms 8 2 will be fulfilled and the children little babies and thoughtless will cast out demons then she came to our meeting and she gave publicly this testimony for all people to hear my dearly beloved brothers and sisters this is how you can prepare for a visitation in closing let me share this with you this evening as I was getting ready to come to this meeting at about 7 15 in the evening I knelt down to pray for all of you so I prayed that the Lord will touch all of you powerfully today and heal all the sick people today as I was praying suddenly I heard the Lord roaring very mightily and this is what he said from what you read in first Kings chapter 16 17 and 18 the Lord Jesus spoke of four things number one Ahab and Jezebel what does that signify unholy alliance an unholy alliance between a believer and a non-believer between righteousness and unrighteousness unholy alliance even when you enter into a business relationship a Christian and a non-Christian that is an unholy alliance righteousness mixing with unrighteousness this is found among you number two false prophets in the land Jezebel set up 850 false prophets all over the land of Israel now what does that signify before she set up the false prophets she killed all the true prophets of <coughs> excuse me Jehovah God in the land and set up false prophets this signifies rejecting or killing the true prophetic voice of the land you're killing the true prophets of the land you're rejecting you are killing the true prophetic voice of the land you are turning your back against the true prophetic voice of the land that God may speak to even through the sons and daughters of this land true prophetic voices thirdly when the false prophets came 
idols and altars for idols were set up all over the land of Israel. And the idolatry led to practice of witchcraft, magic, putting of curses and everything in the same manner. Witchcraft, idol worship found in this land. Fourthly, when King Ahab married Jezebel, because of him, or even the time when he ascended the throne, the Bible says he was the worst of all the kings of Israel, and he made the nation of Israel to turn her back against God. A nation in backsliding. The people of God backslidden from him. You have turned your back against him. Four things. These four things are the sins and abominations that the Lord finds in this land. Can I have a handheld mic? Four things. Unholy alliance. Rejecting, killing the true prophetic voice of God. Witchcraft. Idol worship in the land. And backsliding from following God. These are the sins and the abominations that God sees in your land. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, and my dear sons and daughters, we are desiring a visitation from God. We are desiring a revival in our land. But God sees this abomination in the country. And we are praying. Our prayers are not enough. Because we are just simply praying professional prayers. A one minute prayer for sins is not enough. You need to throw yourself on the floor, on your face, weeping and crying, mourning and crying for the sins of the land. You may be righteous, your church may be righteous, but there is still sin in the land. There is still abomination in the land. Am I right everybody? Unless and until the sins and abomination are get rid of in the land, then the glory of God cannot come down. If you read 1 Kings chapter 18, before fire came down from heaven, Elijah, when he constructed the altar, it signifies he was standing, he was bending his knees, standing in the gap, interceding before God for the sins of Israel. He repented. The he building, repairing, the Bible says, he, he repaired the altar of the Lord, which means... There originally was an altar of the Lord and it was broken by Jezebel, by the false prophets. They broke it down and the altar of the Lord was broken and lying waste. And the first thing Elijah did was he repaired the altar, which signifies a turning of the face to the living God. That's the first thing. And then he cut the bull. Repentance for sins. Repentance for abomination of the land. Turning back to God. Causing a nation to turn back to the living God in true repentance, true weeping, true mourning. 
a righteous prophet of God, a righteous people standing between God, a righteous God and sinful men. Where are such people in this country? Where are such people? You know, this afternoon I shared, when I prayed like this for the US last year, when God told me he was going to send a mighty judgment upon the US, three massive earthquakes striking at three specific places in the US, I cried before God. I said, Lord, so many people are praying in this country, in the US. Why can't you have mercy upon the land? Why can't you? You know, just gathering once a year to weep and pray is not enough. Once a year event is not enough. Once in three years, and you gather once a year to celebrate a hundred year celebration is not enough. It must become a lifelong thing until the glory of God is restored back. Until the abomination is removed from our midst. Till then, you cannot stop your tears. You should not hold back your tears. You should not hold back from moaning. You should not hold back sitting in sackcloth and ashes. You should not. This is not the time for fun and games. This is not the time for vacation. It's not time. Because we are still in a battle. When the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Hebrews 9.25, He is constantly praying, making intercession for us. What are we doing? We are having fun times. We are just enjoying our life. We care not. You know, you have a great promise in your land. A great promise. Those of you are come, who have been coming regularly to this IFP conventions, you've been hearing the promises that God has spoken over the Philippines. Great, awesome promise that next to Israel, you are the only nation in the world that God had made such promises. When you have, don't clap, listen please, don't clap. When you have such exceedingly great and precious promises, and they have not come to pass yet, how much more you should contend for your destiny, instead of just giving it up. When you lose once, you lose twice, you give it up and walk away. You know, the prophet Moses, when he was sent by God to Egypt, he lost nine times. He faced nine failures before Pharaoh. Because every time God told him, go and do this miracle and set the people free. Nine times, Moses performs a miracle and Pharaoh did not release the people. Which means, Moses failed. Right everybody? He failed. But did that stop him from pursuing? No. He went and he went and he went and stood before Pharaoh. Because God says, go and do it. Because the battle is not over yet. On the tenth time, God said, this is the last. At this miracle, he will surely let the people go. And sure he did. When the firstborn of all Egypt died, including the animals, Pharaoh let the people go. So Moses got victory on the tenth time, not the first time. And Moses keep on contending for his destiny because that is his call to set the children of Israel free. That was his call. You don't give up. You don't give up because you have a call until 
Philippines becomes a praise and a sign and a wonder for the rest of the world. You should keep on contending for your destiny. You don't let your guts down. You should stand in the gap, bend your knees, fall on your face, weep and cry and pray for the sins of the land, for the abominations of the land. You should do that. If you don't do that, then the wickedness will overtake you and we will lose our inheritance. You know, God promised if you turn back from all your wicked sins, He will not even allow a single natural disaster to come to your country. We just had one super typhoon that came. Although its power was lessened, still it came. It should not come. But why is all these typhoons, floodings and earthquakes coming? Because of the sins and of the abominations in this land. We must uproot them. Don't let them remain in your land. Uproot all the false prophets from your country. Uproot all idol worship from your country. Uproot every false religion. Uproot everyone who is a false believer. Uproot every false apostle, false prophets, false pastor, false teacher. Uproot them and sanctify the land. Purify the land for a mighty visitation of the glory of God. Amen. Let's all stand up for a word of prayer. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. You heard how God sees. How are you going to respond now? What are you going to say? Are you going to say, here I am Lord. I will stand in the gap. I am going to weep and mourn until every wickedness is uprooted from our country. I perceive in my spirit some saints from heaven standing in our midst. And these saints have been entrusted with the responsibility to oversee intercession in the land. And they are looking around with earnest look in their eyes and earnest look in their faces. Who is here? Who is willing to weep and mourn for this nation. They are looking around. Are you the person they are looking for? If you are, get up from your chairs and come to the front right now. If you don't mean it, don't come. you will seriously stand in the gap. You will stand in the gap for your nation. You will weep and pray. Are you the person? Are you the person?
you let God see your face. Can we push back all the chest to backwards, please? Please kindly push the chest backwards. Are you the person? Are you the person? Are you willing to take hold of the horns of God? Are you willing to take hold of the horns of God and fall on your faces? Not only today, but every day, every day to cry unto God for the sins of the land, for the abomination of the land, so that your intercessions, your weepings, your tears will uproot every wickedness in the land every abomination in the land are you the person are you the person please kindly push back all the chairs to the backwards please please push back all the chairs we don't need the chairs anymore since we are going to end now please please push back all the chairs those of you are standing, you can come to the front. You fall on your face. You kneel down before God. You covenant with God right now. Lord, I am going to stand in the gap for my nation. I am going to stand in the gap for my city. I am going to stand in the gap for my village. I am going to stand in the gap and I'm going to weep. I'm going to mourn. I'm going to cry. Oh Lord, forgive us, Lord. Oh Lord, forgive us, Lord. For being so careless. For being so callous. We have been so selfish. We have been so self-centered. Let that be your cry now. We have been very self-centered. We've been very selfish because you only thought about your own blessings. You only thought about your own goodness. You didn't stand in the gap for the nation. I see mighty angels standing in our midst right now. They are at least about 10 to 12 feet in height. These mighty angels are watching, standing here to see. the ministers, the intercessors, and the people, how much you are willing to bow down, to kneel down, to weep for the land. This angel has been sent to spy the land now, to look at them who will stand in the gap. This angel now says to me, Son of man, tell these people that those who weep and mourn, those who stay before the porches to cry for the land, they will be mocked. Their names will be written in the book. I see this angel taking a small bag from his right pocket and his, it has got some kind of a liquid and that liquid is the spirit of intercession is a spirit of supplication it is like a tear that is going to drop into your eyes so that you like jeremiah can say 
Let my head be like waters and my eyes like fountains that I may weep and pray for the perishing daughters of Jerusalem. Thank you, God. This angel will go around to see all those who are sincerely, sincerely praying. And he's pouring this a single drop of the tears into your eyes. Don't control your tears. Don't hold back your crying. Don't hold back your voices. Let your cries be heard. Let your cries be heard like a rumbling thunder, like a rumbling sound. Let your tears roll. Let your tears flow like rivers for the perishing daughters, for the perishing sons, for the sins, for the abominations in this land. One more time, I'm hearing this angel saying, just like he said during the anniversary celebration of CLSF, raise up a prayer watch exclusively for your president. Stand God, intercede for him day and night. A prayer watch should be raised up. A prayer watch should be set up to pray for your president continuously that the evil influences, witchcraft influences, black magic influences will not surround him, but they will be broken so that the angels of God can go and minister to him and speak through him. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I see many, many saints coming down in our midst right now. All those who are sincerely weeping, all those who are receiving those tears from the angels, these saints are going to work together with you. They are going to pray together with you. They are going to intercede together with you. They are going to help you to intercede for the land. They're going to help you to weep and mourn for this land. Oh, my baby, Kaba Baba Shato Baba Shati, make his la Han Mushati, for Harat Laba Shata Baka Shati, make his proffered Baba Shata Baku Bush, make Hilaba Sato Bashati, make he a Halaba Sati, Mel Rabalaba Sanda Baba Shati. Oh Lord Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, Spirit of the living God, whoever is worthy, whoever has found favor in your eyes, whoever has poured their hearts and their spirits to weep and pray, I pray the angel will pour these tears into their eyes. And when they receive the tears, let them tangibly feel a drop of the heavenly tears, the spirit of supplication, the spirit of intercession, the spirit of mourning, been poured, been poured over them. Let them feel this anointing come all over them. Thank you, God. Oh, Baba Shla the Bokshat Tribiki. Oh, Bikit Rebika Baba Bashatu Bakaba Shatti. Oh, Firi Bika Baba Shatu Bakaba Bashat Tribiki. I see an evil appointed over this land 
that it's slowly going to stretch its right hand and its right leg to grab your nation and to spew the dragon stretching out its right hand and left hand forward to lay and put its claws into this nation that she may spew a kind of a dark cloud dark fumes to come over the land this evil has been appointed